it's been a few months since I've done this. You're actually a lot closer to this than I am. You just did that unscripted podcast you were telling That's me. That's right. What was that like? It was uh, really. I, it was the third podcast that I've done with the medical students. The first was just tell us about ophthalmology. You know, why you went into ophthalmology, and it was inspired because the M1s, M2s have had such a little exposure to clinical uh, shadowing this past year because of the pandemic. So some of the medical students got together and thought, well, let's do a podcast, and people can virtually learn about specialties. And then the second was actually a series talking about microaggressions and implicit bias and how those things play out in a kind of a clinical setting. And some of the things that kind of tie into physician and society, social determinants of health, that sort of thing. So it was a two-part sequence of that. And so um, it was interesting. I was interviewed by the M2s and I, I don't like, you know, I haven't listened to so many podcasts. I don't like that luxury sort of thing. So I was afraid that with the M2s, I would have to kind of break out into lecture. But they asked such riveting questions and all of this. So it really stayed very conversational. It, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Would you recorded that here at the med school? Uh, we did it remotely. We did it kind of through Zoom and they did some other sort of backup capture of it too, which I, I'm not sure exactly what they did. Right. Okay. So it so was a virtual recording. Nice. It's, it's really crazy how much virtual screen-based teleconferencing has permeated oh the goodness. past year and a half of our lives. It, it will be fascinating to see how much of it uh, remains after COVID settles down. I think we have gotten so accustomed to doing things remotely. I, it's hard to imagine that we go back to the way we were before. I think it's fair to stay, at least for sure, some hybrid format where uh, there's an in-person component and you can tune in virtually. I think so. I think there's been the pros, obviously, I feel like I've been able to attend a lot of events I wouldn't have been able to normally, but I do think it can be abused if done too frequently. Exactly. Um, there have been articles written right about Zoom fatigue where you don't have the standard nonverbal social cues, cues you all. would in real life. You have to make eye contact with a screen. You're fixated to a device so you can't really move around. Um, and people, I think, just after a year and a half are sick of it. Are tired of it. I think humans just crave social interactions and we just want to be together, which is why Ascaris 2021 is going to be very interesting in Las Vegas. The first global ophthalmology conference of, at that scale to bring everyone back together. It's going to and be how very, that will very work. interesting. It, it yeah. will be very interesting. Right, right. Man, have things changed? The class of 2021, the second half of their experience has been like something. None other. None other. You are someone who's on the M1 and 2 and M3 and 4 curriculum committee, so you're probably the perfect person to ask. But from a resident perspective, I've seen how physicians have responded, how healthcare workers have responded. But what was the medical school's response like when, when COVID first hit, when the lockdowns were happening? Um, the first lockdown happened. I had an in-person required physician and society section. And uh, the administration said, go forward with that. You, I, I can't personally cancel a, a lecture or a course. And I was told that afternoon, go forward. You cannot cancel your class. And so I got a stream of emails from students saying, what's going on? You know, or should we stay in? The so at about two o'clock in the morning, I send an email to the dean requesting I think we need to cancel this class and then kind of made an executive decision when I didn't hear back by four o'clock in the morning. And uh, that was the launch of COVID and teaching in the classroom that uh, we canceled the session down and we have never met together in person as physician societies uh, since that day. Since that day. No. Wow. But it, we already had in place, I feel like here at Cincinnati, a very good system of streaming lectures, being able to download them afterwards. So was that a difficult transition? I, I won't quote the actual statistics, but I know the majority of medical students do not attend the lectures. They just consume them sort of virtually or, or peripherally. You're absolutely right. The majority of didactic lectures are recorded and students love to listen to them at double speed. It, it seems far more efficient to do their work that way. But there are some elements of medical school that just don't really translate to the virtual world. So things like uh, gross anatomy, um, clinical skills, 
Um, and even in physician and society, uh, which is dedicated to physician identity formation and a lot of things that build on empathy and interaction, um, they become really very intimate sort of small group um, experiences that we have had to learn how to take them into a virtual environment. So there was a fair amount of transition that had to happen for the things that were much more tactile than the streaming lectures. So it has been, it has been an adventure this last year and a half. Something else that we do amongst the first two years is we have our learning communities. And so you're with 11 to 12, 13 co-medical students and you meet weekly, you're involved in the gross anatomy cadaver dissections with them. And so you, you form a small mini community just by virtue of being a medical student here. And I'm assuming they didn't have that, at least the medical students starting in the pandemic. No. What, what efforts were made to try to formally foster some sort of camaraderie or togetherness? Because uh, so much of that just organically happens during orientation when you start medical school. But in the midst of a pandemic, I'm assuming on the record, a lot of that just wasn't happening. It, it didn't for the large part. And if you ask me what the greatest loss was of the COVID year, um, it was that sense of camaraderie. Fortunately for the M2s, they had a year already of uh, kind of consolidating as a class, forming their identity, getting to know classmates and being able to tap into that network in spite of being isolated at home. The M1s walked into medical school, um, many of them from other cities, not connected to Cincinnati, not connected to UC at all, and not knowing their classmates. And the first time that they really kind of all got together and got to meet each other was in uh, longitudinal uh, clinical skills, LPCC. And um, that was in February. So for the majority of the year, um, they met by Zoom in their LCs, um, but um, not that sense of camaraderie, class um, identity. It permeates even, just thinking about this as we're talking about it now, it permeates even much more than just starting medical school because from people, for people who are coming from out of town, they are, and if they're not familiar with Cincinnati, they're trying to find an apartment, they're trying to find a house, maybe they have to fly here to get here. And there's all this unknown up in the air stuff about air travel, the safety of it. A lot of apartments um, are not doing in-person tours or visits. So much of that is virtual. And so you're trying to make these very big life-altering decisions at at the start of what is going to be a life-altering experience over the next four years that will ultimately shape who you are and what you're going to do for the rest of your life, almost on a win, almost on a leap of faith uh, without a lot of direction. And it was a very new experience, I'm sure, for everyone, the administration, the, the people involved with orienting medical students, getting them involved? Lots of challenges. And for example, and and you're exactly right, coming to a new city, a new environment of medical school, um, not having in-person lectures. And the administration spent uh, really endless hours at night, on the weekend, and we were really flying the plane and building it all at the same time. For example, when we came into the um, winter holiday, we didn't know how long it would be, whether we would allow students to go home um, and do classwork from home, when we would require them to come back. And so there was that ambiguity that just really surrounded the students on top of everything else of how their year would, would play out. And so it has really been very demanding for them. And as you mentioned, um, just interacting with physicians, being in the clinics, shadowing, getting an idea of what direction their career is going to go. All of those things were really truncated this year. I'm sure. I almost feel like maybe it was in some aspects, the M3s and M4s who were more affected, but at the same time, they had those first two years prior to COVID hitting that they kind of were in the system. They knew each other. They had that camaraderie in place. But There are some people who think that medical school should not be four years, that it should be three years, that so much of the M1-2 curriculum could be done virtually. Prior to step one becoming neutered and becoming pass-fail, I almost feel like if every student was given $5,000 and they bought 
Sketchy, they bought First Day, they bought Pat Belma, they bought all the other digital resources for learning. And then they just spent two years on their own studying. They could probably get a killer step one score. And you know, and you could just put in sort of LPCC, physician and society, clinical skills, some of the other aspects of the curriculum in there. But you probably could truncate medical school to almost half the length of what it currently is. And I think that just speaks to how much maybe the first two years are primed and set up to adapt to a virtual environment. But you can't really do that with M3 and 4, where the bulk of your experience is interacting with patients, working on a clinical team, experiencing the OR, experiencing the floors, seeing all these different specialties. And if you don't already know what you're going into, trying to figure out what flavor of medicine you like best. How, how, did, the, how did the medical school and the curriculum committees adapt for the M3s and M4s? Well, I, I'm going to digress just a little bit with one thing that you mentioned, which is there is a pilot program that is starting in the fall, looking to see whether we can actually decrease the length of time uh, to, uh, of medical school for a cohort of students um, and looking more at achieving competencies rather than a timeline. And so are there uh, metrics that we can monitor in students over the course of their medical school experience, specifically with the aim of uh, completing medical school in in three years. So people are very much looking at that. In addition, the curriculum is undergoing some revision to decrease uh, the amount of clinical, preclinical time, come to the clinics earlier, and then use the fourth year as a customized approach to medicine. So if you already, for instance, know you're going into ophthalmology, you might choose to use that time uh, predominantly to take electives here and away, you know, anatomy that pertains to what you're doing, a much more customized approach to, to medical education. But coming back to your question about M3s and M4s, I think they had it really just as uh, a difficult time as the M1s, M2s. Uh, it was just different. And uh, for the current graduates, um, they, um, it, it really hit them right in the middle of their M3 year. They um, went to a pass-fail uh, temporarily. Um, they had to stop out for a period of time. It was unclear when they would need to come back in. We had to rework some of the core clerkships of surgery and internal medicine um, and the requirements to keep students on schedule to be able to finish medical school on time. And away electives, which are so critical um, in the whole process of, you know, deciding what you want to do, where you want to go, what other programs are like, um, our, our students just really didn't have an opportunity to participate in that at all. And the current M3s, um, they, they were on the sidelines kind of watching all of this play out, not knowing at all how their third year experience would be. So really, really challenging for students all the way around. I joke with my sister because she went, she hit M3, M4, M3, beginning of M3, I think, right when the pandemic was hitting. Uh, and so much of her school, so much of her curriculum went past fail. Uh, and she had more time off, I think, than previous years. So I joked, I said, you've had the easiest medical student experience in the history of any person trying to become a physician. While simultaneously, probably also being the, the most stressful and some of the hardest, hardest obstacles to overcome on that journey. Um, the, the movement of some rotations to pass fail when med for many medical schools where getting honors on those rotations is so critical to class rank or GPA, and then being able to put together a very competitive application for applying to certain more competitive specialties. That also was this huge unknown variable, at least here, how was AOA status and, and how were things like that managed? To be determined still. Um, and post match still to be determined. <laughs> yeah. Still well, as the as the as the current group of students uh come forward, um what's interesting is uh there is a very critical look right now at um making the whole school go pass fail, uh kind of on a ongoing basis. Which has been done at other schools. Which has been done. And that's exactly the impetus to take a close look at you at the University of Cincinnati. You're exactly right. And so uh, when it first came up for discussion, maybe four years or so ago, 
uh, everybody thought, well, I don't think that's really going to happen here. Now, I'm not sure, uh, but it is far more plausible that it would happen here. And so the discussions that are the offshoot of that are um, then what does AOA look like? Um, Does class rank fall away? Um, How does that impact students who are applying for more competitive specialties? So uh, that uh, on the heels of step one, going to pass fail, a lot of the metrics that have kept residency program directors kind of anchored in their decision making are falling away. So it, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. So potentially more medical schools go pass fail. Step one's gone pass fail. Step two will still have a numeric score, but program directors are losing a lot of these traditional metrics they had for being able to figure out who would maybe be a good right a good fit for the program or specialty. How do you see that changing things? Well, it's interesting that the two main drivers for this pass fail, one of them is wellness, the whole concept of uh, burden, stress, and wellness for uh, medical students. The other driver uh, for a pass fail system is taking a more holistic approach um, to um, developing students and encouraging program directors to take a more holistic view of, of students, which I think is a, a wonderful thing. I, I, but truth in advertising, uh, what I, I must say is um, ophthalmology is the only third year elective that has the option to get honors. All of the other um, non-core clerkships during the third year are pass-fail other than ophthalmology. And that didn't happen by accident. I made a specific petition um, as the uh, medical student educator, the, the clinical, uh, the clerkship coordinator for ophthalmology. Uh, to keep it as honors, uh, because I am aware that that, that is uh, advantageous to people who apply in ophthalmology to demonstrate that they are able to perform at an honors level in ophthalmology. So I am not sure. As I uh, sit around and talk to uh, program directors, um, I think in theory, when you talk to them at first, they say, well, that's great. We'll, we'll evaluate people holistically. And then all of a sudden, the uh, conversation switches to, but we still have step two, and that has a score. So I think we're going to move away from metrics uh, pretty slowly, actually. Yeah, it's. I feel like some of this is just political correctness on the on the spectrum of wellness. I mean, the medical school is stressful. stressful. You're, there's no way you're ever going to be able to take that out. People are some of the most brilliant intellectual people will come across in life or everyone who gets to medical school goes on to become a physician is super smart, super capable. And I feel like most specialties are taking a holistic approach right now anyway. No one, maybe step one was used as a threshold cutoff or are we going to invite them for an interview or not? But a lot of places, the application, extracurricular activities, maybe some of the research they've done, life experiences, are there non-traditional applicant, all of those things kind of factored in to the overall, you know, ranking of an applicant. So I'm not sure how much changing everything to pass fail, getting rid of step one being, you know, this critical score is going to improve things. I think I've heard some medical students say it's actually going to increase the stress because now all of a sudden you're, you're taking step two later in medical school on a timeline, much closer to applying for residency. And so now you maybe don't know how competitive you're going to be for a certain specialty if you don't have that step one marker kind of dividing the preclinical years from the clinical years. And now it's one test. Before, if you did, maybe not as well as you wanted on step one, step two was an opportunity to really shine and show that you made a difference. And I know plenty of people whose program directors say they got the interview because of how well they did on step two to show that they were able to improve from step one. Maybe students won't have that opportunity now. Step two maybe just became much more uh, powerful than step one ever was in terms of dictating someone's fate because there is, you can't count on step three to, to improve on after step two. I think you raise a lot of really critical questions and issues there, which is uh, there is no one stop magic solution for a very nuanced situation, which is you're absolutely re- correct. Uh, you have a lot of brilliant people who are high achieving, used to working hard, very competitive, 
And how do you structure a medical school that doesn't encourage people to burn out? And is there a quick fix in taking a score away from step one? And remains to be seen because step one is going to pass. So we will still, we will soon see from this experiment what, what happens. Um, but I think a lot more needs to go into it. For instance, um, I, you can't teach medical school in 2021 the same way that you taught it in the year 2000. The amount of knowledge, um, the rate of knowledge, um, the obsolescence of knowledge, the degree of critical thinking that medical students need to have in order to interpret what will be even a greater velocity of knowledge going forward. Teaching medical students for the 21st century looks very different than it used to. And so for people who are medical educators uh, to be very, very thoughtful, very mindful in terms of what am I teaching? Why am I teaching it? Am I teaching it because of tradition? Am I teaching it because it needs to be taught? How am I teaching it? Sometimes we have multiple exams that stack up on the same day. Uh, that's stressful. I mean, so certain things that can go into how a curriculum is structured uh, in terms of the logistics and the content, um, those are the sort of things that are kind of that deeper dive into wh why do we have a, such a stressful um, curriculum? And you're right, at the end of the day, there's no cakewalk through uh, medical school. It, it's difficult, it's demanding, but I think there are some things that can be done. Um, I am. Um, concerned that taking the score away from step one kicks the can down the road to step two. And I dislike that people pull themselves away from competitive specialties on the basis of one score. However, people do that earlier in their career than if they get a lower score on step two, which happens later. And so um, if a metric is going to be used, um, it becomes far more challenging if that metric occurs later in the course of medical school. And so I think we may get an unexpected um, consequence um, of altering step one that I, I think we have to really be mindful of in terms of advising students. Right. I always felt that, you know, step one is a very stressful I mean, it's still kind of, when is it 2022, the first group of uh, this people? This class is the last class. Right. We'll so it's still score. currently, there is a numerical score right. associated with it. I always felt that step one was definitely a significant marker in medical school in terms of doors potentially closing for certain specialties you may be interested in, in becoming a part of. But, and there, I have plenty of people who said, no, I'm I, the stress of taking standardized tests always gets to me. I'm not a good test taker, but I do great in, on all other tests and grades in the preclinical years. I almost viewed step one, though, as the big equalizer because you have medical schools all across the country. Certain schools are already all pass-fail. Some aren't. Uh, professors are of different backgrounds. Uh, the material is all the same, but the way it's delivered is done very, very differently at different institutions. And so you have all of these people, all of these medical students at different places, eventually all applying for the same specialties. How do you tell what someone has learned if, if you're not familiar with each of the many curriculums of the medical school? Well, here you have step one, a standardized exam where every single person, theoretically, if we take away the cost of all the study materials, has access to the information that's going to be tested. You have the same amount of time, the first two years to study for it. And to me, step one was the equalizer, really leveled the playing field. If you were able to rise to the occasion um, and really deliver on this test that every single person across the nation took the same thing, maybe it didn't matter if your tests were a little bit wonky earlier on, or maybe you didn't do as well in the first two years as you would have liked. And now all of a sudden, you're able to catapult yourself to become more competitive for some other specialties. And so I think if things go past fail, People who are maybe already at a disadvantage because maybe they didn't do as well as they wanted to lose that edge, the ability to shine and show, hey, I am capable of doing really well on standardized tests. I, do, I did master the, the educational material from the first two years, even though I might have had a little bit of a bumpy start. I, I think, again, you bring up a really uh, 
points that we're, we're going to have to address in, in medical education. And you're absolutely right. Um, it, it is a bit of an equalizer across schools. And when you take that away, it becomes far more challenging for schools to have some sort of metric to understand what the M1, M2 years meant across the board at very different programs. Because I can tell you, M1, M2 years look very different at at different schools. Um, you, again, it, it's there's no quick fix to this, right? And so the challenge with step one is the concern, and perhaps a legitimate concern, that there are biases that exist in step one. So rather than taking step one away, it, so probably the better way to, to say it is, is step one a true proxy for what is learned in M1, M2 year is probably the better way to say it. Are we really measuring what is learned in M1, M2 year, or are we measuring something else? And there are some questions about the validity. That you go back to the exam and you make sure that you're measuring what is really an adequate proxy for M1, M2. And then it becomes an equalizer across the board. To take it away, um, does introduce additional challenges. Absolutely. And so what it may inadvertently do, and a concern that I have voiced, is particularly, for instance, in ophthalmology, where there are people who apply from schools where there is no ophthalmology program, there's no opportunity for ophthalmology research, um, people have access to bigger names in ophthalmology to write them letters, and other people don't. Um, then we get into um, other things that may influence why someone gets uh, a residency position um, that is a greater distance away from achievement on an exam. So I understand the discussions that happen around step one, and there is some legitimacy to taking a look at that exam again to make sure that it really is measuring in a valid fashion performance during uh, M1, M2 years. Um, taking it away is not necessarily a free lunch um, in terms of moving to a holistic uh, uh, approach to evaluating residents. I was very surprised at how quickly that change happened because there'd been rumblings of step one going pass fail for a lot of time, probably most of my medical school experience. But then just like that, it went pass fail. And I said, wow, this is, this is a huge change. Uh, even just between, you know, my sister's five years behind me in age. She's five years younger than me. And just the experience I had going through medical school and the way step one was viewed. Now, she still took step one, still had a numerical score, but the way it's being viewed now by some of the M1s who are just starting is completely different. And I really do think, I mean, M1, uh, step one was such a Goliath, was such was, it was this thing in the sky and it cast such a shadow, you know, over the first two years. Absolutely. It, it was always lingering in the background, the stress of step Lurking. one, right? You knew it was a a obstacle you were going to have to confront at the same time as everyone else when you started medical school. But now it's, and then you throw COVID on top of all that. And there's so much other, there's just so many things in flux. Right. It's, it's very interesting. The, the pilot program you talked about, is that going to be done here at Cincinnati? We're going to try that out. How are they going to select who can be a part of that? People and, are going to uh, opt in. It, it will be a small cohort and uh, people will have the option to, to opt into that. Is it going to be like first come, first serve? Because I, I could see a lot of interest in this pilot. Oh, I, I don't know whether the people conducting the pilot are, they have a cutoff. So I think it probably will be first come, first serve. Got it. Very, very interesting. I'm curious to see what the results of that are like. Yeah, because we, we are all very curious to see. Yes. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they are performing just as strong or stronger. Than, than medical students did on the traditional medical school curriculum in terms of hitting all of the, the goals or, or objectives that we, we talked about. Um, you're right. The way, the way medical school is taught today is very different than it was five years ago, 10 years ago. And I think that just kind of mirrors medical knowledge in general. So much of what we learn in medical school is maybe not obsolete, but outdated. Even in ophthalmology, right? As a resident, trifocal technology just hit the United States. We have, uh, you know, when I started, ophthalmology, I, there were still people talking about restore and, and lenses like that. And now we're talking about panoptics and just being able to see in, in the 
six years since I've been in the world of ophthalmology, I can already see these life cycles of new technology coming in and out. And I know that in five years, we're going to be talking about something completely different. And I think medical school is just like that. The way, the way people go through medical school now is very different than it was just not too long ago. And, and really trying to teach students to, like Wayne Gretzky, go, going to where the puck's going to be when you're not really certain where that is. And I think, if anything, uh, COVID has certainly taught us um, how you have to be able to practice in a very flexible, uh, open-minded uh, fashion before you have all of the facts, but putting those facts together that you do have in a way that is rational and evidence-based to take care of patients and such. Um, it, it really is, is fascinating to watch. There's a new, um, relatively new concept called becoming a master adaptive learner. And it is an attempt to have a more integrated approach between undergraduate medical education and graduate medical education. So for instance, are the things that we're teaching in the M3, M4 year in ophthalmology, those things that program directors really expect people to have? And not just in ophthalmology, but professionalism, um, evidence-based uh, interpretation of medical literature. What, what is it that program directors really want, and are we sure that we're delivering it? That's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is people really talk about what's required to achieve mastery. You know, how many hours, um, deliberate uh, repetition, all of the things that we know. But becoming a master adaptive learner is not just becoming a master of a craft, but having the ability to maintain that mastery over time. So you make it up the hill and you achieve mastery and you don't do what's required to maintain that same mastery, but it's an adaptive mastery. Much to your point about how rapidly ophthalmology is changing, how, how do you train people to have those sort of um, metacognitive skills um, to be able to self-correct, to analyze information, um, basically retrain themselves throughout the course of, of their, um, their medical careers. So It sounds like you're discussing what does it mean to be a lifelong learner, which is a phrase that has been around for the longest time in medicine. But now we're really getting into what does it mean and what, what are the processes involved in, in that? Right. Uh, very right. And so even if you talk to a, an M1, they will almost by rote tell you, I am a lifelong learner uh, because it, it sounds like something you ought to say, right? Who, who would be against it? Right. Uh, but what does that really look like? How do you teach those skills to somebody? How do you assess them to know that they have those skills? Um, and now the medical educators really, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. How do you teach that? How do you know students have that? Um, and what is our role in making sure that we don't bog people down with things that are not conducive um, to developing those skills? To go back to what you said about the ophthalmology M3 clerkship being the only rotation or clerk, elective clerkship where you can get honors, I think that, that the way that elective is structured almost forces medical students to have to adapt because you have two weeks. And when we say two weeks, we're really talking about 10, 10 days, days. 10 days to, if you're not familiar with ophthalmology, all of a sudden, what's a slit lamp? Figure that out. What, what is the eye? What is the basic anatomy of the eye? You have to pick, find an interesting case and present it, right? You have to do a written test. You've got a good memory, Arjun. Yes, you do. <laughs> I remember this vividly. And, and I, when I meet with <laughs> medical students, I tell them right before the rotation starts, I say, you have to be dialed in for these next 14 days you, if you really want to do well on this. Um, and so there's, it forces medical students, I think, to, to really buckle down and throw themselves 100% into it because time is so short and there are a lot of objective metrics you need to hit if you want to honor that rotation. Uh, and I think that, I remember when I was in medical school, across the board, I think we had maybe 10 or 14 people who took the elective my year and they all said, by far and away, the hardest, the hardest rotation of medical school, a two-week ophthalmology it's elective. But, uh, but I like it. I, and I think, I think that forces people to really have to become the best version of themselves and adapt. And it really, it really does. And it is fascinating on the instructor side of it to see the 
distance that a student can cover in two weeks is really extraordinary. And you have someone who comes in and they're not really sure how to turn on the slit lamp and, you know, which side of the direct ophthalmoscope to look through. And by the end of the clerkship, they are giving a case presentation and it's cogent um, and they're discussing a a medical uh, issue, an ophthalmologic issue and uh, conducting an examination. It it really is uh, very gratifying. But you're right. You have to be all in. Right. I mean, in to that extent, it's a stressful experience. But now if you were to put that at scale, right, and have sort of the rest of medical school like that, you look at what what undergraduate students are like when they start medical school, the level of knowledge they have, and then what they are like when they graduate medical school, right? It's, it's a night and day difference. And so at the end of the day, there's no getting around the fact, like I said, that medical school is stressful, but you come out of it such a different person with such a immense amount of knowledge you're lear- you've learned the language of medicine, you know, it's, you're just, everything about you is just very different. And then you are on your way to being a physician who can take care of patients and their, their illness and their well being. And, um, it's a, it's an amazing journey. You know, it's very stressful, but it really is an amazing journey. And to your point, it's, it's also interesting to watch the demeanor of students at the other end of the clerkship, that sense of self-efficacy, uh, that I can do this, I can do this examination. And I tell them, um, for good or for bad, you can do a better eye examination than just about 90% of all other people, non-ophthalmologists in medicine at this point. And um, they feel encouraged to come back into Hawksworth and spend afternoons because they feel like they have an adequate skill set to, to build on after only two weeks. And so... You know, listening to, uh, listening to you say that, I think we should make it mandatory and maybe we should do an interesting study. We'll see if the number of uh, fungemia DFE consults and papilledema consults goes down if everyone <laughs> has that experience. Interesting that you raise that. This year, I took COVID as a window of opportunity to do something that I had wanted to do for quite some time, which is as a medical student um, educator in ophthalmology. I felt badly about all of the other students at UC who don't do the third year elective. And we don't have a mandatory elective in ophthalmology at UC, as is the case for the overwhelming majority of medical schools. So with COVID, I I coded an online course. It was a four-week elective, asynchronous. um, And there's a white paper that the AUPO has done of what you should know about ophthalmology by the time you graduate medical school. And so this four-week elective breaks down all of that information into four modules. There are videos, there are Jeopardy interactives in this, and, you know, the 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 end-of-the-week quizzes. And the people who took the course were M4s, who were planning to go into internal medicine, family medicine, emergency medicine. Um, And in its first year, this course uh, became the second most popular elective in the M4 year. And I just got such wonderful reviews back from students. In fact, I think the best reviews I have gotten since being at QC came back from this elective. And, and the comments that students wrote was how much more they knew about ophthalmology, how useful it would be. So I hadn't thought about looking at consults as a result of it, uh, but that that would be something interesting to take a look at down the road. I'm obviously biased. I think ophthalmology is the best medical and surgical specialty of out course. there. And so why wouldn't everyone want to learn more about of the course. eye? But I do think if we can demystify looking at the fundus earlier on, I think we would get a lot more people interested in ophthalmology. I don't know if we necessarily have all the residency spots to do that, but I think when we were, when I was going through the clinical skills curriculum, we used a direct ophthalmoscope and most of the time we just faked, oh yeah, I can see the optic nerve. And they didn't. Right. And, and they didn't. And plus, to be honest, a lot of those direct ophthalmoscopes didn't work. They, the, the, the lens in there is so dirty. It's, I mean, even as an ophthalmology resident, I was using those. I said, okay, no, no wonder no one can see anything. But I think if we can really get medical students access to that, early on, that can probably stimulate a lot of interest. Like the, the ultrasound lab that was done, right? Learning how to do a B scan. Um, you know, all of a sudden students were like, oh, okay, this is what the inside of an eye looks like. This is the anatomy of an eye. That's kind of interesting. This is how light enters the eye, hits the retina and does all of these things. 
Whereas before it's just, you know, maybe one or two hours of a lecture in the traditional medical student curriculum. And I think having that experience, the experiential component of it. And so before COVID, um, we, we have a course here, Clinical Skills. And I was speaking with the two course co-directors for clinical skills um, to have ophthalmology be a component of the case. And we were actually looking into integrating it because I think it's really important for ophthalmology not to be something that's a part, but an integral part. So they had two cases that we were looking to bring ophthalmology in. One was an MS case and the other was a diabetic uh, patient. And um, to, just as you say, to get students familiar with the fact that the eye is part of the exam for both of those, and it's not something that you just pick up the phone and call the ophthalmologist, that, you know, it's, it's part of the, it's, you know, you don't pick up the phone and call the cardiologist when you want to know the heart sounds. Right. We have a significant amount of the cranial nerves, can't deny that. That's so. right. To, to me, you know, the, the eye is a very critical part of, of the human body and people who are surveyed about their greatest fear in life, you know, public, public speaking is up there, but going blind, you know, most people would rather lose one of their other senses than lose their vision. Absolutely. Absolutely. For, for the medical students who just recently applied during the COVID pandemic, everything, and I, I know that you're super interested, you know, in this sort of stuff. So I, I wanted to talk to you about this. Um, they couldn't do their away electives. The AOA status was undetermined. Um, there was this fear of our institutions just going to take their own students. How did that impact how the medical s- school and counselors advised people applying? Did they apply more broadly? What strategies were used this cycle to try to maximize each individual's chances of successfully matching? The timeline for the whole process shifted this year. Right. And so things really played out very differently than they had before, in addition to the fact that everything was done virtually. So um, we had to re-instruct everybody in the timeline and what those timeline benchmarks meant, because they meant different things this year than they had in the past. So we wanted to make sure that students understood exactly what was required and what was happening at each time point. And then we spent a fair amount of time um, training people in how to do a good virtual interview. And some of the points that we talked about earlier, how do you make good eye contact? You know, make sure that you've got a quiet place. Don't have hair in your face. You know, all sorts of, make sure that you have good bandwidth when you're online. Um, all of the things that you don't have to think about when you're in person, but you do have to think about in addition to putting your best foot forward. So um, we, um, I am on the Medical Student Educators Council um, for the AUPO. So I wrote out a worksheet for people who were for virtual interviews, and we also did practice interviews with with students. The other part of um, the whole process is was where do you apply? How broadly do you apply? How comfortable do you feel with signing up for a program sight unseen? And it, it, like everything else in life, there's the spectrum. There are some people who are, you know, they, they are very, um, very uh, energetic and, and uh, almost like voyagers. And they're very keen to go to a place, a kind of sight unseen and other people a little more like settlers. They don't want uh, anything that they haven't had a chance to go and check out themselves. And so speaking with students to see what their comfort level was. um, And uh, a lot of programs intentionally tried to have um, events, virtual events. And it was the best that we could do, uh, but uh, certainly a long distance from kind of boots on the ground, knowing what a city is like, getting the feel of a program. And so the students were really left at a deficit without being able to do that. Um, I think many programs did opt more towards taking students that they knew uh, rather. And, and it's hard to know whether it was students felt more comfortable uh, ranking uh, more highly programs that they knew or programs, probably a combination of both. 
sight unseen is, is almost an understatement because some of these students matching are matching for potentially seven years. Exactly. A massive, massive commitment. Life altering commitment. Yeah. No doubt about it. And we, we talked about this a few months ago, but uh, ophthalmology is traditionally an early match. Um, and we were still, even though the timeline was delayed by a month, a month this year, we were still in tandem with urology, the first to see what the results were. And our match experience was going to sort of project for the rest of the medical school or, or for the graduate medical education, what to expect. How did that pan out? And what were some of the lessons learned? Yeah, it, well, to say I was holding my breath is understatement because you put all of these things in place and you're advising students about how many programs and where to look and how to do your virtual interviews and all of these things. But this was just uncharted territory in all of this. And overall, we did really, I think, quite well. Um, I don't know whether it was because of our preparation or in spite of it. I, I think um, we obviously we matched two people here at our program. Um, uh, we match students away from our program as well. Um, and so I will be eager to stay in close contact with the students who matched away just to see how well they get settled into um, their new residency program. Uh, because for the ones that matched away from Cincinnati, um, they did not have any prior relationship with the programs. And so it will be, it will be a big transition for them. There is traditionally the SF match. Yes. And then there is, uh, I'm already forgetting the terminology, ERAS, right? For everyone else, ERAS. So you have the SF match, you have ERAS. Ophthalmology, we applied through SF match, which is a separate application. So this past cycle, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Everything is totally different. And the SF match decides to completely change its interface, change the application, which was a huge controversy. What was the logic behind that? Why pick this cycle out of all cycles to implement it? Even if they were planning on doing it this cycle after COVID hit, why not just delay that by a year or two? Well, I, I have to say that I was not an integral part of that, but certainly heard about it very closely on the sidelines as it evolved. And so um, you're right. It had been in the works um, for several years. And it had come at the request of applicants for a more streamlined approach. And the program directors had also expressed an interest in having kind of real-time updating um, a dashboard, a platform for that. Um, But it certainly did come up in conversation, as you might well imagine, that the timing might be better served um, to postpone it for a year or two. And uh, long story short, the consensus was that it represented such an improvement over the former iteration of the match application process that it would still serve the students better to go forward with a new interface um, this year in spite of the other changes that resulted from COVID and virtual uh, interviewing. Right. I, I was just peripherally, like I said, vicariously in touch with the normal application process because my sister was applying, but I was much more in tune with the changes to the SF match because I was applying for fellowship. And so I got to witness it firsthand and experience it. And as someone who had used the old application format compared to this new one, I, I do think it was probably a bit sleeker, easier, easy to use, user-friendly, much more in line with what ERAS is like. Um, I did kind of, when I was applying initially to residency, I didn't necessarily like the open text format of the old version of SF Match, but then grew to really appreciate the customizability of it. And you sort of had elements of that in this new application uh, format, but a lot of other things are far more standardized and you lost the ability to put your own unique flair or spin on certain elements of the application. But what I found uh, most frustrating for me was it was very glitchy. And because the fellowship applications are due before the residence application, right. the residency applications, there were just a lot of things that weren't working. And I'm sure they were so busy and inundated with smoothing out the little kinks that, uh, you know, I would send in uh, messages like, hey, this feature is not working or this description doesn't make sense. And I wouldn't get a response back, but a day or two but later, it would, it, would, it would change. And I would say, okay, they're clearly working on this. But I think even when I applied, when I would go to see all the programs I applied to and listed every single program as being the same and being out of like Virginia or something. So 
I didn't have a lot of faith in the, in the process until the interview invite started to roll. And I said, okay, it, it is working. Uh, but one of the cool things was you had the ability to customize your personal statements. Yes. Which was a very interesting addition uh, and, and very nice because if there were certain aspects of certain programs you really like, you could address that. Although I wasn't sure how it would be taken the first cycle like that if you wrote a personal statement completely unique to a certain program, if they weren't used to receiving that, if they would kind of not know what to, what to do with that. And, and that was part of the advising that changed this year too. Uh, the medical students could also customize their personal statement and the discussions that surrounded how to do so. And what we advised people against was uh, having a final sentence that was fill in the blank for the particular program, which I, I think most programs interpreted as spam when we got them and read them. Um, so programs uh, pretty quickly realized um, if everything looked like a standard issue and then their name appeared at the bottom, it, it did not go particularly well. Um, and so we certainly discouraged students from doing that. But there were a few students who had really very specific um, interest in a geographic location or a particular program. And, and they, they did. And we got a few of those and they, they really were fairly compelling um, when it was clear that they were speaking about specific components of our program and really quite knowledgeable and a very cogent argument for why this program would be a good fit. Um, I really think it can work to your advantage. Right, right. How did our, our selection process change in the middle of COVID? Um, we, um, I, I, without giving away the secrets, yeah, I, I will not give away. I'm, try, <laughs> I'm trying to realize which, which of the secrets I cannot give away. Um, certainly trying to make sure that we had a very standardized experience for everyone, um, in an away, uh, situation w where it was virtual and trying to see, making sure that everybody had really, a, uh, uh, was on an even footing with that. We were, we are always relatively late in the process. And we were, I think, among, um, if not the latest program in the country, uh, certainly among the handful of latest program. And so we were really quite um, pleased at how many programs, how many students um, interviewed with us when we were so, you know, towards the latter part. And we were sure people were really quite Zoom fatigued uh, by that point. Otherwise, a lot of our discussions um, really didn't change a great deal. Did we see a big uptick in the amount of applications? Do you feel like, I mean, ophthalmology, most the average application is in the six, high 60s, early uh, into the know, 70s, 70s, right? Yeah, so. into the 70s, unfortunately, now. So we did have an uptick in, in our number of applications this year. We what, certainly did. What did the AOPO do? I know that I saw they were putting on like educational webinars for how to use the SF Match application best practices for virtual interviewing, that sort of thing. How did they guide the ophthalmology cohort that was applying this cycle? Right. Well, um, it, that grew out of uh, all of the angst that medical student educators across the country, th that they were sensing from the students. And it came back to everything kind of being cobbled as it went along. And um, the actual timeline uh, was a, a, a bit delayed in coming out. And so for a while, students weren't clear when certain deadlines would occur and the whole concept of interviewing remotely and how that would influence decision making by programs. Um, some programs had um, virtual dinners away. Some had happy hours. Others didn't fireside chats. And so trying to keep a centralized place for students to be able to get that information. And so it grew out of trying to um, make some sort of an infrastructure for students um, to feel comfortable about going through what was a new experience on a lot of fronts this year. It was interesting, even on the fellowship end, there was similar things. Some programs had not virtual dinners the night before, but they would send you, you know, like swag bags or goodie bags and, or they would send you, you know, like virtual gift cards so that you could order your own lunch and kind of eat lunch during the you know, halfway point of the interview day to sort of mimic what that experience would like. It was a nice touch. I wasn't expecting any of that. I, I, I was just going to ask you because that has come up as a discussion. Now, uh, programs are limited in the amount of money that they can put into each swag bag so that Ooh. no one has a competitive advantage 
and it has come up for discussion whether we should allow swag bags again this year, whether applicants like them or not. So I'm 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 curious your your thought whether this is just an ophthalmology or yeah, just an board. ophthalmology. Who voiced this initially, or was this? Are there multiple programs who felt like they didn't give, then didn't put their best competitive uh, well, advertising uh, put forward? I, I will not divulge the 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 people who have raised this as an issue, but it is uh, uh, percolated up um, to the people who make the decisions um, as to whether the swag bags are uh, are a good idea or undue influence or unnecessary. Well, they're certainly not necessary, but uh, when you can't visit a program. When I was interviewing for residency and it was all in person, there was still a very stark difference in terms of what programs gave you. Some programs gave you uh, coffee mugs, they gave you uh, like actual tote bags, they gave you lookbooks, they gave you flash drives. So there was never anything standardized. And it sounds like there was never some sort of formal budget cap before either. I don't either. think there was before. And you know, this year we um, had standardized. Uh, keeping track of the number of uh, interview um, positions too. So things are, are a little more centralized. I certainly took note when a program went all out and provided more of a swag bag type experience than other ones. I mean, it was a nice gesture, but it never factored into... I mean, that's not something I can't imagine any residency applicant is going to base their decision off of. So... I can certainly understand the desire to want to standardize anything, but I don't think anyone made any residency decisions based off of some program had a $30 launch versus another program which had a $10 launch. You could probably read into that uh, if you're you know, a residency applicant and try to project if you don't know much about a program, what that means. But that's probably reading into it a little bit too much. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. <laughs> when I was a M1 or M2, that year... The ophthalmology match uh, was quite bad here for Cincinnati. We went like one for nine, one for eight, something like that. And so I didn't discover ophthalmology until M3. But even years before discovering ophthalmology, the reputation, at least in my group of medical students of ophthalmology was that this is a super, super competitive specialty that is very hard to get into. And I feel like we had a great match cycle this, this past cycle. And since I've been a resident, and honestly, since I've been a medical student, we've been very successful in matching medical students and, and getting them into ophthalmology, oftentimes at the program of their choice. Uh, and I think you are, in, in part, a large uh, reason for that happening, which I want to get into in a bit. But um, you said you're, direct, you're director of medical student education for ophthalmology. When a student comes to you for the first time, either as an M1, M2, M3, even M4, depending on when they discover ophthalmology, they voice interests. How do you tailor your, tailor your approach to those meetings and how do you sort of individualize the guidance you give students? I, I individualize is really the, the operative word. And it depends on where they are, whether it's an M1, M2, or M3. And what I usually start off is I, I want to know who the student is, what their interests, you know, where they go undergraduate, what did they major in, is not, what are their interests? And to begin to understand enough about them to um, imagine where in ophthalmology would be a nice entry point. So, for instance, if a student comes to me and says, I did a lot of um, oncology research as an undergraduate, that would take me in a maybe different way from somebody who was in bioengineering and liked techniques and procedures. Um, the pairing up, the mentoring m might look very different um, knowing about the student. And um, some students will come to me and they are already pretty certain that they want to go into ophthalmology. Other students are not at all certain. And I think it's really important to let students know that medical school is the time for exploration. And so I feel like I've done my job well if you land in a specialty that suits you and makes you happy. And I certainly hope that will be ophthalmology. But if it's not, um, certainly don't feel like you have to, you know, be willing to sign in blood um, that you're going into ophthalmology before you come to speak to me. So I really try to keep an open door policy. And I think that encourages people to come and meet with me earlier in their medical school career um, rather than to wait until they're an M3 or about to go into M3 and 
relatively certain and then think that that's the time to come by and visit. I really, I really think your approach to mentoring and advising medical students is, is wonderful and I think it's spot on. When I met with you for the first time, I remember the, our conversation vividly. It was at the conclusion of M2 and I had just taken step one. And I had spent the first two years of medical school thinking I was going to go into a specialty that I eventually realized I just couldn't see myself doing for the rest of my life. And so I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I kind of just scattered, sent out some scattershot emails to the heads of departments or, or liaisons for medical students in specialties, which I felt like I had not been exposed to in medical school. And one of those was ophthalmology. Um, but immediately before our meeting, I had met with the dermatology department. And the conversations could not have been more different. The disparity between the two was absolutely huge. The conversation on with dermatology was much more, okay, here's what your step one score is. Here's what your current class rank is. Here's the kind of research you've done. This is sort of the percentage chance you have of matching into dermatology based on all of that. You know, if you wanted to increase your chances, you could, uh, you know, do this many more publications. And exactly as you mentioned, 30 minutes later, when I get to your office, I was expecting somewhat of a similar conversation. But the first thing you said was essentially like, what has your experience in medical school been like? And then one hour later, I'm leaving your office. I'm like, that conversation did not at all go like I expected. But I left feeling like you, someone who I probably didn't interact with very much in the first two years, despite you being a block director for Physician and Society, had just taken so much time to invest in getting to know me. And I felt like I had a lot of confidence in you. And I felt like already we had a good relationship. And I felt very comfortable navigating discovering ophthalmology and then eventually applying for ophthalmology and matching into that. So I, I really, really like that approach. And I think um, it is honestly one of the reasons we have been so successful here at matching, matching students in ophthalmology. Well, you're very, very kind to say that. And for me, the fun of it is really that relationship. And unfortunately, sometimes I have to say things that are not always what students would love to hear. Um, but it's important for me to be um, supportive, but truthful, because too much rides on the decision and the whole process for me to tell students anything other than what I believe to be true. But it is very different to do that based on a relationship where students know, I hope they know, that the, the direction that I come from is really trying to promote what works best for them and um, outlining where things stand, what we can do to make things better, things that are going to be challenges. But I have, I have never discouraged a student who wanted to go into ophthalmology, whatever their score was. I just thought, who, who on earth am I um, to rain on somebody's parade if it's their lifelong desire to apply in ophthalmology? I have to tell people the truth about, you know, how, what, what the odds look like. And then I fight like heck to try to get them into a residency program. That's amazing. You're, you're so involved with mentoring our medical students here. I'm sure they're meeting with you at your office. I see them all the time in Hawksworth in between, uh, you know, the lulls between staff and patients. I see them come in and I overhear sometimes some of those conversations they're having. And it takes me back to my first meeting with you. You're also, you've been very involved with the Academy, with the Minority Mentoring Program. Yes. You were a founding member, correct? That's right. What, what uh, is that program, if you could just get into it in a little bit, and what have, how has the program been doing over the past year or so? Sure. You know, I, I think there's been a uh, understanding across medicine that there is strength and diversity. And as our society becomes more diverse, there is a need for medicine to reflect that diversity. And ophthalmology is such a wonderful specialty um, that I think it faces the challenge that you have alluded to, which is um, we're not part of the M1, M2 curriculum. And particularly if you are first generation to medicine, but particularly if you're first generation um, to higher education, you might get well into your third year of medical school before you even appreciate. And I've even had students who've been in their fourth year of medical school before they even, even recognize uh, that ophthalmology exists. 
And so the mom program is designed to um, find students who are in their entering into their M1 year um, or at the latest their M2 year and introduce them to ophthalmology. And so it's the same sort of no commitment to it. Um, obviously, these are students who think that they might have an interest in ophthalmology, but by definition, they're students who haven't been exposed to much ophthalmology. So it wouldn't be appropriate for us to have a, a, this firm understanding of commitment to going into ophthalmology. So the way that the program is structured is that we um, let medical schools know that the program exists so that they can send out information to their incoming students. We have mentors who are ophthalmologists who have expressed an interest to be mentors. And that mentor panel is quite diverse. There are certainly underrepresented minority ophthalmologists on the panel, but many of the mentors are not. They're just people who feel a commitment to wanting to have diversity in ophthalmology. And so um, students have the opportunity to learn about the timeline for applying in ophthalmology, what's required, what makes for an optimal um, application to apply in residency, options for research. Some underrepresented minority students are at programs that do not have an ophthalmology program. And so uh, kind of building a network um, so that students can, you know, they have a summer um, they can go to a program that does allow for them to do ophthalmology research and get some publications out of it that they wouldn't be able to get most likely at their home institution. That's really nice. And I saw just a couple months ago, the Academy posted a few videos that you did in collaboration with the AUPO on, I mean, maybe it was just one uh, long lecture they did and they diced it into segments, but essentially uh, guidance uh, as part of the minority mentoring program. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I, I honestly thought a lot of that advice was salient and great uh, and could be applied really to, to medical students, you know, oh, across possible. the board. Right. It was really great. Just a few hours ago, you were recognized in Cincinnati as the YWCA, one of eight career women of achievement. And when I saw that, it really made me smile because I thought there's, there's no one more deserving than you who could receive that. And I saw okay. the little video segment they put together, which I thought was very, very elegant. But I had to write down that quote because I, I, I really love this. There was a line you said where you said, it is essential to lift as you climb. And that really resonated with me. And I thought it was great because I think paying it forward is so important to help those on their journey as we have been helped in our lives. How did you become so passionate about mentoring medical students and guiding others on their own journey? Uh, a couple of things, really. Um, I mentioned in that video that I had never seen an African American woman off the uh, physician actually when I decided to go to to medical school. And um, in all candor, in medical school, I was really under mentored. And I think when you're under mentored, you sometimes have to do things in a harder way than you had to. And so that kind of stuck in my mind that. If I could make it a little bit easier for other people um, to not have to reinvent the wheel so much, uh, I would like to do that. And I think you get to a certain stage in your life and in your career where you are concerned about what happens really for the next generation. You get really very committed to that. And so I think it's the combination of ophthalmology has been just such a wonderful specialty for me. I you know, I, I certainly didn't come to medical school planning to be an ophthalmologist, but wow, uh, for me, it was like a grand slam. You know, it just really has been so wonderful. And how do I get back to ophthalmology? And how do I support students that are the next generation uh, of physicians? And, and so that lifting as you climb is going forward, but really making sure that the people behind me. And in this case, it's the students who will be that next generation. What can I do to make that road even a little bit easier for them? That's fantastic. You are a medical student, uh, you're director of medical student education for ophthalmology, like we discussed. But even if someone is not going to go into ophthalmology, and let's say they don't meet with you to discuss that as a career path, we are all introduced to you very early on, like we, we've alluded to many times already, uh, because you are block director a block director for Physician and Society, which is a longitudinal two-year course focused on uh, health disparities, professionalism, ethics in medicine. These are all very important topics 
but probably a lot of the times under-prioritized or not valued as much by medical students as some of the more um, core components, the, the medical knowledge um, that's acquired over the first two years. What made you become so interested in these topics? Because it's not something that I think people are traditionally interested in beyond just kind of hearing about or learning about in their process of becoming a physician. Well, um, two, two things in that. First is I, I am a native Cincinnatian. And the reason that I came back to Cincinnati was because both of my parents became unwell at the same time. And so it really became imperative for one of the siblings to come back to the home front for that. And so for the first time in my life, I had the opportunity to see medicine from the patient's point of view. And I, I really thought I had won awards for, you know, being a clinician and all sorts. So I thought I, I really pretty much understood that. Boy, I didn't. And um, in some cases, I was so impressed by how wonderful and empathetic and caring the physicians were that took care of my parents. And in some cases, I was dismayed. I was truly dismayed. And these were people who knew that I was a physician. And I thought, my goodness, if this is what happens um, when the treating physician and team understands that I'm a physician, what happens to people who, um, who don't have that degree of health literacy, who um, don't feel comfortable being advocates um, for their health care or family members' health care. And so um, as I kind of reestablished myself in Cincinnati, um, this course came available. And Physicians Society um, does deal with ethics and um, cultural sensitivity, uh, end-of-life decisions, um, various biases that physicians have. Uh, but at its core, what it really um, talks about is physician identity development. And as you alluded earlier, if you are the same person when you leave medical school as you were when you started, something went terribly wrong during your medical education. And it's not just that you know information, but you fundamentally become a different version of yourself. And how does that happen? And how do you take the aspects of yourself that exist before you come to medical school, intertwine them with the process of becoming a physician, and then come out at the other end of medical school a compassionate, thoughtful, knowledgeable physician that is unique to what you brought to medical school? And physician in society is a very integral part of that. How do you think through ethical issues? How do you deal with healthcare disparities? What is really your role in this? What, what is the role of the physician? What's not the role of the physician? Um, and um, so it, it has uh, become really quite a labor of love for me to, to teach that uh, course. It's really quite a joy. Labor is not a bad way of putting it because that is a, it's not just a one or two lectures and done type of course. It is really nicely integrated throughout the curriculum. It is a two-year experience. You still give some basic ophthalmology lectures to the M1s. You are director of medical student education, but you're also director of the Hawksworth Eye Clinic. And I staff patients with you, at least on this rotation, probably two or three times a week. And so you're wearing so many hats, you're juggling so many responsibilities. How do you keep everything straight? How do you prioritize what needs that? Because I'm sure your inbox is probably a very, very... Very deep. Yeah, my inbox sometimes is a very scary place. I, I don't invite anybody to take a look. Um, I think it's because each of the things that I do, I, I just think they are so important. And um, so sometimes it is a little bit of a balancing act between them. Uh, but at Hawksworth, I, I so enjoy working with residents. Um, and um, the patients that come to Hawksworth almost are the embodiment of the social determinants of health that I deal with in the classroom with the M1, M2s and the challenges. And as you well know, um, transportation insecurity, insurance insecurity, health literacy, 
challenges of not having English as your preferred language. All of those things really come to life in terms of how do you um, practice in the context of those challenges and still deliver excellent care in a way that feels thoughtful and, um, and compassionate to the patient that comes in. And that's no small charge. And it's an important one. And so that keeps me uh, certainly in, in, in that environment because I, I just so believe it is so important, as are the medical students. Well, we're, we're, very, we're very grateful for the amount of time you invest in both the medical student and resident aspects of the medical journey that is becoming a physician and an ophthalmologist, at least here in Cincinnati. You touched on something. You said when you, you came back to Cincinnati um, to take care of your parents who were unwell at that time. Uh, you, I know you went to high school here. Did you actually, were you born here? I, I am a native Cincinnati. You're a native Cincinnati and, and you went on an amazing journey before you came all the way back here. You did. <laughs> you went to high school here. I did. You went to Harvard for undergrad, Harvard for medical school, Stanford for residency, back to the East Coast, Mass Sionier for corneal, corneal fellowship. And then in the past five years through Hopkins, you got the health professions, uh, master's in health profession and education. You have been on a tour de force of some of the nation's highest academic institutions. And uh, I'm always curious because I know there's got to be so much more behind just the list of letters after your last name in the institutions on your CV. As a young girl growing up here in Cincinnati, were you interested in science from a young age? Like what, what pushed you towards medical school? And I guess even what pushed you towards Harvard? So I'm, I'm smiling, Arjun, because I was uh, born at Old Jewish Hospital, which is literally a stone's throw away from my lecture hall in physician and society. So boy, did I ever take a long tour to end up back at the same spot. So uh, yes, I am a native Cincinnatian. You know, um, I, at Walnut Hills High School, Walnut Hills is a college preparatory school. And so Um, In my graduating class from uh, Walnut Hills, there were five of us that went to Harvard. I think there were eight that went to Brown, three went to Yale, two went to Princeton. So it was not unusual for a class to go to the Ivy League. It was kind of if you did in the top of your class. And so I graduated really at the top of my class. So I kind of, you know, I, I went there. It was my first time being away, away from home. And so, uh, and then I stayed on at Harvard for medical school and enjoyed that experience. You notice there's this trend of going from one coast to the other. Uh, I, I like the ocean, so one coast to the other. And uh, enjoyed my time out at Stanford and then came back to Boston. And then I went back and I was on faculty out at Stanford for a while. So I, I spent uh, just over a decade in, in the San Francisco Bay Area and enjoyed that as well. So uh, it, it's just really been a wonderful adventure, actually. Were, were either of your parents physicians? My father had his PhD in biochemistry. So very much uh, science. My, my father uh, uh, was uh, a very much, uh, had set very high expectations for us. And I can remember so clearly, I was in what would now be called middle school. And I came home and told my father, I got an A on this exam. I got a, I think it was a 92 or 93 on the exam. And my father said, mm-hmm. did anybody else get a higher grade on the exam? I said, I think there was one guy who got a 98. I said, oh, okay. Well, somebody got better on the exam. Was this your best effort, this, this 92? And I thought, oh, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, it might not. He said, oh, okay. So I'm to understand that I am supposed to get excited because the teacher clearly taught it at a level that somebody was able to get a 98 and this was not your best effort. Come back when you get the highest grade in the class and it's your best effort. So he set a very high bar uh, uh, throughout education for for me and my siblings. And so um, uh, we knew what we were expected to do. And uh, so that that was a lot of motivation. So he was very much uh, involved in the sciences. Did you kind of know going to, uh, when you went to undergrad, that you were going to pursue medical school? I anticipated that I would. 
Um, I went to um, college planning to major in either biology or biochemistry um, with the expectation of going to medical school. Got it. And what was it when you were at Harvard that made you want to stay on and not immediately go to another coast? I really enjoyed being in Boston. I, I really enjoyed uh, just the, the ambience of, uh, of being in New England. And uh, I did go out and take a look at Stanford when I was uh, considering medical schools. And quite honestly, the weather seemed too nice and I wasn't sure that I would stay inside and study. And it got so cold in Boston, I figured, well, at least during the middle of the, middle of the winter, I'd be inside studying. That's hilarious. Um, we've said ophthalmology is by far and away the best specialty, but how did you discover that initially? I, um, as an undergraduate, I did a lot of what would now be referred to as service learning, a lot of work in the community, um, and planned when I went to medical school to be really a, a general internist in public health was my thought with what is now kind of clearly become known as social determinants of health and such. And then um, I ended up taking an elective uh, during my third year, early in my third year, and loved it. And I wrote back to my father, and this is the most bizarre thing of ophthalmology of all things. And my father said, there's an ophthalmologist here in Cincinnati. I think you should speak to him. And that ophthalmologist was Chester Pryor. And Dr. Pryor was the first African-American ophthalmologist here in Cincinnati. And so when I came back on break, uh, Dr. Pryor graciously, he was just, he was wonderful. He was so welcoming and so supportive. Um, and so this whole crazy idea that I had, you know, who, ophthalmology, who ever heard of such? He said, yeah, no, it's a great specialty. I, I think you'd be a, a good fit for it. And, you know, he showed me and uh, it, it, really, it really made me comfortable with the decision to go forward in ophthalmology. Very, very cool. He, he still shows up to all of our lectures. Yes, and he it's, does. Uh, it's great talking to him because he has such a wealth of experience and many, many years of knowledge about how the field has evolved and even how ophthalmology being practiced in Cincinnati has changed uh, over the years. I'm someone who just went through the fellowship match process myself. And when I started ophthalmology, I wasn't set on a certain specialty. And early on, I thought I was going to do retina probably for the first year. And, uh, you know, I, I thought about glaucoma. I found that intellectually stimulating and then, you know, cornea and refractive. And I, I, it's hard to go wrong, I think. Once, once you're an ophthalmologist, it's hard to go wrong. And honestly, if someone put a gun in my head and said, hey, you're, you can't do fellowship and you're going to have to practice general ophthalmology for the rest of your life, I'd say, hey, you know okay. what? I'm all right with that. That's, yeah, I, that I think I'd have, a, I'd have a good life and I'd, I'd have a great time taking care of patients and get to see a wealth of diversity in pathology and, and presentation. How did you decide cornea? I think my uh, old internal medicine habits died hard. And when I was out at Stanford as a uh, resident, I had several unusual infectious disease cases and got really um, involved with the infectious disease people and, and a bit with the rheumatologist with um, corneal disease, you know, Sjogren's syndrome and such. Um, but I just really, uh, it just really clicked for me. And I like the surgery, I like the surgery, I like the medical conditions, and it just felt like a very natural fit for me. And I have to say, of all of the academic years that I had of training, the two years that I spent in fellowship were really like the cherry on the Sunday. Uh, you know, and I enjoyed my residence, and medical school was fine, but oh, wow, what a great two years it was and to be surrounded by people who just, they, they were finished their training. They were there because they loved ophthalmology. They wanted to learn more about it. Fascinating cases, challenging things to do, just learning a lot. It, it was really a wonderful. So I think you are just going to have a really great time. I can't wait. I can't wait. I've loved residency, but I, I, something tells me I'm going to love fellowship even more. You, so you did fellowship at Mass Ioneer. But before returning to Stanford, you had a, you you worked your way back to I the West my Coast. Way. I sure did. And you were recruited to Southern Illinois to create a cornea uh, service. I'm I'm imagining 
doing that in a year and a half. And that's hard for me to, to, to fathom or wrap my head around. How did that happen? Did you just wake up one day and there was an email and someone said, Hey, we heard about you and we'd like you to create an entire subspecialty department? Well, uh, yes. And so I spoke with them uh, by phone. We uh, uh, discussed it. And then uh, we met at the academy that year. And then the next week, I went to Southern Illinois and kind of saw the lay of their land and how things work and um, came into their program. I, I think maybe a little hubris there in terms of uh, stepping in. It, it, was, it was a big lift to um, uh, design it. I was also head of the iBank. Why not? While I was there. And so, um, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot of skills in building that, that have repeatedly uh, kind of echoed throughout my career as being very helpful in starting new programs, creating kind of the infrastructure for things. And I, I am sitting here thinking now, but I, I wonder um, if I would have found things more challenging not to have had that foundation. And I have never thought about it quite that way before. And uh, I was not there long before my old chairman out at Stanford called me and said, I, I know that you're starting this thing in Southern Illinois, uh, but we lost our cornea person and can you come out? I said, you know, I, I, I made this commitment here. Um, I, I can't, I, I really have to at least see it through this year to get things up and going so that they can have somebody to come in and he said, I'll, I'll hold the position for you. And, and he did. He did. That's why I was wondering what the, you've been recruited to create a service. And then uh, not too long after that, you're back at Stanford. So he, so then you become director of cornea at Stanford. You become director of the ocular microbiology lab. Simultaneously, you are chief of ophthalmology at the Palo Alto VA and you're director of blind rehabilitation as well. Well, it's not, it's, it sounds like I just have this inveterate of wearing a lot of hats, Arden. If you are the chief of ophthalmology at the Palo Alto Veterans, part of that position is Western Blind Rehab. So that it is a combined position. So, but yes, you're correct that, that those, those were, those were my positions while I was out there. I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you it anyway, because I think this is so remarkable. How old were you at the time? Uh, it was a 30th birthday present. I was a little bit on the fast track in medical school, so kind of finished medical school a little bit younger than some people do. So um, to imagine having gone and had the academic experiences you had, create a cornea service, and then come back to an institution like Stanford and wear all of these hats—that is just that is absolutely amazing. How long were you were you there at Stanford before you sort of moved on to the next phase? I think it was seven and a half years, kind of in that, right in that range. Um, so, um, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was so much, it was so much fun out there. Um, so, um, that was during the period where LASIK was just really getting started. And so, um, I went to Canada, you know, it wasn't FDA approved, uh, here in the United States during that period. We were last to the party. We were As you know, the, the, the cornea people were just really crying in their beer because Europe had it, Canada had it, Mexico had it, and so um, a lot of the training that I did was with colleagues down in Mexico. So I would go down to Mexico and see what they were doing, and we would take patients up to from you know the Bay Area up to Canada, and it was just it was just so much going. It was just really it was really an exciting time. Uh, all of the time in ophthalmology has been an exa. Yeah, you'll see. You'll see. You 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 went to Harvard. And you went to Stanford. You went to Mass Eye and New York. You've been to Hopkins. You have experienced truly what it means to work at an academic institution, to lead academic institutions, and then all of a sudden you have this change in life where you swing all the way to the private practice end of things. You go to Maryland and you establish your own private practice, which. I have known you now for some six years, and I don't think I knew this until about a year or two ago that this happened, and it absolutely blew my mind. And I'm so curious as to 
what motivated that change, what inspired that, and what led to that absolute 180 in terms of career environment? You know, I think, Arjun, I I look back over my career and about every mm, eight to 10 years, I tend to reinvent myself is what happens. And for me, it seems to keep that energy and zest in ophthalmology. And I know for some people, it works for them to go to the same office every day for 30 years with the same people and, 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 that, and that works for them. That doesn't really work for me. And so I just kind of shake things up a little bit. And boy, was that ever an experience. And, and I, I kept my foot in academics. I did quite a lot at the University of Maryland. And, and, um, and, and so I don't want to suggest that I ever got too far away from, uh, I'm, the, I'm like the Peter Pan. I never grew up and left university. Uh, but uh, that was really my four-way, four-way into, into uh, private practice. And again, I, I learned a lot of things um, that are really quite helpful, um, believe it or not, in Hawksworth right now um, in terms of um, uh, management of staff, uh, management of over, uh, approaching overhead, um, challenges of billing. Um, those are the kind of things that having had a private practice experience, I think are particularly helpful. It's different in academics, but there's some things that are, are true again, across the board. I have a very, very deep respect for entrepreneurs because I feel like being an entrepreneur is the complete antithesis to what we experience in our journey to becoming physicians because we essentially spend the first three decades of our life in school, moving from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four, and then finally you graduate residency or fellowship and you get your first job. Everything is laid out for you in terms of what you need to do next, but creating your own private practice from scratch is a completely different experience. There's so many unknowns. You're not just responsible for taking care of patients, but you are responsible for taking care of the employees there as well. And you are no longer maybe just naturally getting referrals because you happen to be at an academic institution and that's where the pathology comes. Now, especially if you're in the world of refractive surgery, let's say you have to have a marketing aspect to things. So the business side of things, which we're not really taught about at all in medical school or residency comes into play. How did you navigate that? And, and I'm, you're giving me flashbacks to how I did navigate that. And, you know, the first three months, I, I was right off of the heels of Stanford, where I had two wonderful administrative assistants, one at the VA and the other at Stanford, and they were marvelous. And uh, you're right, the referral patterns were established. And I suppose, naively enough, I, I hadn't really thought all of that through. And so when I opened my practice, talk about a crash course in marketing, you know, how, how do you market, talking to people from the cable news stations, how do you make ads, how do you, how do you get known in, you know, in the community, how do you recruit good staff, how do you keep good staff, things that have to do with human resources, which I never thought about before, um, had your billing, which is very often handled by somebody else. How do you get a team of people who are very efficient in handling your billing? Um, all of that, I, I learned very, very quickly. And I was very green, remarkably green. How did you decide on Maryland? Wonderful question. A, a large part of my mother's family is from Maryland. So I, although I'm from here in Cincinnati, I have very deep roots. Uh, in the Annapolis, Baltimore area. So um, a very natural place to land and very academic in its orientation with Baltimore. So it really was, was a nice fit for that. So you started essentially the practice from nothing, built it from scratch. You grew it to size. It sounds like it was incredibly successful. You had a very large patient base. And then you are an almost forced to return to Cincinnati. How do you, do that? I'm assuming the practice closed or did it continue and remain? How do you navigate the other aspect of things, the other life cycle, life cycle mm -hmm. of a private practice? Mm -hmm. 
And so, and and again, a crash course in learning how you uh, transition out of a practice. So the practice was sold. And then there are certain things that you have to put in place. Um, you know, for instance, your malpractice coverage. What happens when you move away from a practice to make sure that you have adequate tail coverage for that? Um, who is uh, responsible for, for charts as patients want them over time? Um, once you've stepped away from the practice, lo- lots of nuance to how you uh, transition out of a practice. So then finally... You come back to Cincinnati after coast to coast. You cannot escape what it is to be an Ohioan. You cannot. Because everyone always comes back to Ohio. You cannot. They always come back to Cincinnati. And after that, the only time you leave is to maybe go to Florida. That's it. So maybe there's Florida in my future. But (laughs) (laughs) What was that like coming home after, after having done so much already at such a young age in your career on the full spectrum of academics and private practice? It was a bit surreal. Um, I, I, you know, I did not anticipate coming back to Cincinnati. And I think it's pretty safe to say that, but for my parents becoming unwell, I probably wouldn't have. Um, And so you always, I I think most people have in their mind's eye, uh, the Cincinnati or the town as it was when they left to go away to college. And obviously, uh, Cincinnati has matured greatly. Um, since then. So it was familiar, but different uh, when I came back. And, uh, and I, it has really been such a joy um, to be here at the University of Cincinnati. Um, it is, I've had the opportunity to just kind of fill my basket with exactly what I enjoy doing, which is um, working with medical students, physician and society, over at Hawksworth, continuing with ophthalmology. It, it just really feels like a time in my life where I have in my basket exactly those things that I want to have in there and kind of no more and no less. And it's really a wonderful feeling. What, what year was it that you came back to Cincinnati? Um, I think it was 2010. So we are 10 years. What's next? Because I, I sense That's a change right, right? Uh, on your, oh, on your wow. timeline. Something yeah, different is coming. You're right, Arjun. Um, selfishly, maybe one last uh, question from me. You got a perfect board score and were a board examiner for 13, 14 years. That's coming up for all of us who are either graduating residency or going to be doing a fellowship. What advice do you have for succeeding and doing well on both the written boards and the oral boards? Well, kind of the obvious thing is is the study part, which everybody has uh, kind of already figured that part of it out. I think the oral boards, um, as I'm learning, you know, that was affected by COVID as well with doing things remotely. And most recently I heard is that it went so well that people kind of like the remote process. And so I think that is, I think that's going to be an excellent thing for both the examiners and the examinees. So I think that's a very positive uh, thing going forward. Um, With the oral exam, I think uh, the thing that I would mention most is um, the boards are not interested to ask you gotcha questions. They want to know, do you have fund of knowledge that allows you to be a competent um, ophthalmologist? So um, the examiners really do want you to do well and to give them every opportunity to see what you know. I certainly have had people who will look at a picture and say, ah, that's breast disease. No, no, it's not. And I have no idea of the thought process that got them there. So there's no way that I can even give partial credit, you know, walk them through what you're thinking, why you're thinking it, and give them every opportunity. So even if you derail at the last moment, I know where you were going and you were great 95% of the way there. And I understand exactly, you know, where things got a bit off track. And I I feel comfortable to understand the the thought process that was behind it. That's really great advice. Um, I'm going to start delving into that world very soon. So I will keep all of that in mind. Something that you touched on, and I just wanted to make sure if if you wanted to discuss this more that we, we had room for this is, you mentioned that when you were becoming a physician or, or interested in going to medical school, 
as a woman and as a minority, you realize that there weren't, that you were joining a largely male dominated profession. And even today in 2021, there is less than 150 female African American ophthalmologists out there, which is when you, when you just view that figure on paper is really quite, quite astonishing. What, and then the landscape of, of medicine and, and the gender gaps and the racial and ethnic disparities has definitely changed um, since when you were in medical school, but there's still obviously quite a bit of ground to cover still. What advice do you have for young women or minorities who are interested in joining the medical profession or, or becoming an ophthalmologist? I, uh, a few things. First of all is um, I think one of the biggest challenges is to do something that you've never seen anybody do that looks like you and to be open to considering things that you may not have considered, to be open-minded about considering your career. The other is um, I think mentorship is so important. It, it's just fundamental um, because there are challenges that um, students run into throughout undergraduate and medical school that are, I think, unique sometimes to being a woman in, in medicine, unique to being a person of color in medicine. And that's not to say that other people can't understand and can't be supportive. That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes there's a unique understanding that happens when somebody has had a similar experience themselves. And to have that sort of guidance, that sort of mentorship, um, I think is really, really important. There certainly is a need. I, there, it's amazing. It's wonderfully amazing to me how many more women there are in medicine now than when I started. And it's been a relatively short period of time that there's just been tremendous changes. But when you look at leadership in medicine across the board, I'm hopeful that that will happen. Um, there's some metrics that suggest that it's not going to be a slam dunk that that will happen. Um, but we certainly are making progress in that direction. And that, that really gives me heart. Now, I see the changes even from the time I was a medical student, just looking at ophthalmology leadership, where the AUPO uh, is going, sort of the direction they're taking, what the academy's focus is, the current president, the past presidents that we've had, um, you know, I think we're, we're seeing that change uh, incrementally over time. And I think it comes from intentionality too. I, I think it's people realizing that this is important and it's right and, um, and, and putting energy towards doing what's, what's good for the profession. And, uh, and it's, it's encouraging to see it. Yeah. Well, uh, this is fantastic uh, being able to sit down with you and talk about all of these things. You've been a mentor to so many people. You probably really changed the career paths and lives of many, many medical students over the years. I'm certainly forever uh, indebted to the advice I got from you. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. Well, you are very kind to, to say that. And it's so nice. I, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that you sent me that email, Arjun, about ophthalmology and how wonderful to be able to have another conversation, lengthy conversation now as you are getting ready to leave us uh, from residency and really head on. I am, I am so excited for you in terms of what the future holds in ophthalmology. I can't wait. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. I really appreciate it.